Wargaming Recon is proudly sponsored by 127games.com, home of the cheapest access and allies miniatures. Find them at 12-7-games.com. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Wargaming Recon. As always, I am your host, Jonathan J. Reinhardt. I want to welcome all of you to this episode of Wargaming Recon. We are the podcast for you that covers all sorts of historical and New England gaming topics. Last time, we released our fantastic episode 75, in which I was very pleased to discuss all sorts of topics. I will be updating some of those here on this episode, episode 76, but I want to start off with just giving you an idea of some of the topics that we will be covering this time. First up, I've been talking about a book that I received as a review copy. It is Wally Simon's Secrets of Wargame Design, edited by Russ Lockwood. So this time around, I will be giving you my thoughts on this book. Then I will be updating the situation with the Battlefront Games official events or Flames of War. Last time in episode 75, I read you their statement and talked about the restrictions and my thoughts about why they're doing all of this and the changing landscape over there at Battlefront. Now they uh, revised some things, so I will be sharing that with all of you. I also want to give you some thoughts about an issue of War Games Illustrated. War Games Illustrated, for those of you who may not know, is a magazine published and owned by the people over at Battlefront. So I'm going to be talking about the June 2012 issue. It's issue 296. Then, as we move on, I want to talk a little bit about a recent trip my wife and I made to Plymouth Plantation in Plymouth, Massachusetts. I have some other news for you about, you know, behind the scenes things and new measures we're doing here at Wargaming Recon. Of course, I'm going to be bringing you the mailbag because last time around on our episode, we had a lot of feedback about my thoughts and about the situation with Battlefront Games. I was able to share some of those with you at the time, but I have more. I'm delighted to have feedback and I will be sharing all of that with you later on in this episode. Finally, I have a brief sort of update about the Dead Hampton Revolution. But let's get things going with Wally Simon's Secrets of War Game Design, edited by Russ Lockwood. So, I received my copy of Secrets of War Game Design, Wally Simon's Secrets of War Game Design, edited by Russ Lockwood. And I got that kind of out of the blue, but I was very excited about it. To receive this review copy, it's put out by the kind folks and sold over at onmilitarymatters.com. So I had got this because Russ, who's the editor, sent it to me and he's like, hey, you know, he sent me this email and said, do you want a review copy of it? Uh, you know, you could use it for your show or would you be willing to promote it or, you know, put up a press release or something? So I, you know, read his email. I was like, send me a review copy and, you know, I'll look at it or whatever. So I've been spending maybe about two weeks with this book. The book is a soft cover book, 52 pages, and I've talked about this a little bit last time, and then what I also did was I released sort of a preliminary sneak peek video kind of thing that's up on YouTube, and you can find it by going to trollitc.com, and over there, if you click on the uh, button that says Troll in the Corner Podcast Network, you want to scroll down a little bit. Look for the thing that says Wargaming Recon. It has my logo right there. You click on that, and then finally, after going through all those hoops, you will be taken to the page with all the Wargaming Recon content. And on there is a post in which I have a video that covers a little bit of a sneak peek into Wally Simon's Secrets of Wargame Design. Also in that video, I give um, (laughs) a closer look at the Super Carrier book that I reviewed last time. I actually allow you to see some of the pictures, which I had talked about. So one of the difficulties with doing a podcast where it's, you know, vocal only, you can't see the stuff that I'm looking at or that I'm talking about. So I'm trying to paint you a picture, but sometimes it's just better for you to have the picture itself in front of you. So I was happy to do that as an experiment. The video not as good as I would have hoped. And, you know, it was my first time. It could have been better. Of course, the video was taken with the internal uh, camera on my iMac. Not really the best of cameras in the world. You know, good enough for things like telecommunications and webcaming and that sort of stuff. But if you really wanted to give a crisp, clear picture of something, 
you need a better camera. <laughs> it's not in the stars right now. So, right here on Wargame, um, on Wally Simon's Secrets of Wargame Design, he has a bunch of different chapters in here. And what this actually is, it's kind of a compendium, a compilation of some of Wally's writings. Now, uh, in the foreword, so to speak, of the book, is a little statement, and it says, The material within came from the creative and analytical mind of Wally Simon, and was originally published in PW Review Newsletter from the 1970s through the early 2000s. Russ Lockwood contacted the estate and licensed all rights to Wally Simon's writings, selected some of the best general interest articles about wargaming design, edited these articles while retaining Simon's style, and compiled them in this booklet. Wally's original illustrations that were in the articles, few though they may be, were retained. Additional illustrations were added. So Wally has all these different chapters, I guess you can call them, uh, here in the book. And he covers things, uh, Wally's rules, the search for tabletop perfection, to dealing with things for the American Civil War, uh, morale in the American Revolution. He talks about an Indian mutiny game in World War II, covering um, Operation Barbarossa and some Wild West gunfights and so forth. But what he's really doing when he's covering each of these different eras and these different battles, he's using them as a way to test out rules, to test out different ways to handle situations. So, for example, he has one called Big Picture Siege Game. And he uses that to kind of talk about card-based movement, which is really interesting. And he comes up with the decision that he really likes card-based movement. There's good, there's bad about it, but overall he likes it because it has that unpredictability, which is really cool. Now, when he talks about the American Revolution, as those of you who've been listening to the show for a while know, one of my big interests is the American Revolution, or as our friends across the pond say, the American War of Independence. Um, that's one of my big interests, so of course I was very excited about what Wally wrote titled Revolutionary Morale, Reaction Levels, Cards, and AWI Battles. So I'm actually just going to be turning there. While I was uh, reading this book, I made notations throughout it. And um, I'm sorry, you're probably hearing me flip the pages uh, just because of my microphone. But I noticed that throughout the book, there's this term that gets used. And the word is used in a way that I never, you know, I, I never really had expected it to be used. The word is bound. But whenever it is used, it's not, I, I, like, I never came across it. So I did, you know, a little thinking, and I was like, what do they mean? Do they mean, like, a phase, a round? Because it's like a segment of time seems to be how it's being used whenever it's used. And it comes up quite a bit, actually. So what I ended up doing was I said, you know what? I don't know. Maybe this is a mistake. Or maybe, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be, but I, I don't understand it. So rather than just being like, they did this thing, and it's crazy, and it's dumb, and I don't understand it. It's, oh, what does it mean? I said, well, I'm going to take the more intelligent approach, and I'm just going to email Russ. And so I sent him an email, and I was like, Russ, you know, uh, I get this question about the book, because I noticed, you know, it starts off in the American Civil War chapter, and then it says, you know, sometime around bound three, I heard the cry, and uh, is that supposed to say bound or round, maybe? You know, I saw a throw, but... Like, I, I, I never come across it, so <laughs> well, what do you think? And Russ was kind enough to reply to my email, and he said that bound is the correct term. That I guess, and this is before my time, and this just goes to show how I am, you know, <laughs> on the younger side of things. But it just goes to show that uh, things before my time had different meanings than I would have expected. So Russ says that this is a term that comes from the miniatures side of things, from the 1970s WRG rules, that uh, apparently Wally went back and forth between using miniature and board game style mechanics, and some of the phrases were changed as well. So bound happens to be one of those phrases. Russ then went on to say that basically I could think of bound as just another way of saying round, that, you know, it just kind of delineates the time. You could use it as, you know, round, turn, or something like that. So I stopped <laughs> marking up the book whenever I came across the word round, uh, a bound rather, and in my head I just mentally translated it into round, and I thought, okay, so he means round, 
and that's how it is. But anyway, back to what I was going to talk about with revolutionary morale, that Wally creates this really interesting kind of uh, rule set where he wants to play around with how morale impacts games. So what he did was he created a scenario. It's basically Lexington and Concord. Uh, I'm sure we all know the story. The Redcoats are coming, one if by land, two if by sea, so forth and so forth. So he creates this thing where it's at the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and that the Americans need to drive away the British, and the British are coming in. But instead of taking casualties, he sets it up where there's basically morale checks. So that, you know, you quote-unquote lose a guy, but like not really. And he's just kind of trying to play around with how things work out with morale, which is actually really cool. So he covers all sorts of stuff with that, and there's just all sorts of different areas in here. I mean, you know, some articles had more notations than others. And I'm sorry, you hear, it's very unprofessional of me, but you're hearing me flip the, uh, flip the pages of the book. I'm just kind of, um, you know, I'm flipping through and trying to see some things that I made maybe a few more notations on. There's one section in here, Ancient Country Fight, that I thought was really interesting, where Wally kind of sets things up on this ping pong table, I believe it is, and he uses the ping pong table and there's different areas of it, and there's this ancient battle to capture this capital city. So the attackers are coming in, and they're trying to go and work their way through towards the city, but at the same time, there's these isolated fortresses that serve as uh, rally points for the defending units, so that like when a defending unit dies, it can be like respawned, so to speak, in one of these fortresses, and then you know they can come in and harry the attackers on the flank and so forth. So it was a very, it's not quite a battle report, but it was very interesting to read how that played out and what he did with that. Now, I thought... Also, there's a chapter or an article, whatever you want to call it, dealing with Napoleonics. So in this, he kind of talks about national characteristics and how some people like to input national characteristics into the games that they play. So maybe a rule set tries to say, oh, you know, that Prussian units before 1812 should get a plus in firing, but after 1812, they fire like normal people or like <laughs> the Austrians suck or, you know, whatever. So he kind of talks about it, and he comes up with a list of different things, at least as far as Napoleonics go, that seem to be pretty much considered national attributes, national characteristics that appear in rules. But he says the problem with doing all this stuff is how do you quantify it? How do you give it a numeric value so that you can say, oh, they get a plus whatever modifier or a negative modifier or this impacts morale or, or whatever? How do you do that? So he kind of just... He doesn't have a solution, but he kind of just comes up with the idea that, you know, uh, there's a difficulty here. Uh, I mentioned already about the Siege game, but one thing I didn't mention about that, and this is something I thought was really cool, is that the game is played on his ping pong table, as I'm guessing most of these games are. But, and this is a really cool part, the ping pong table serves both as battlefield and map. I'm working on my Deadhampton Revolution, and on that, of course, I have a map, but the playing surface is separate from the map. So things on the map, you know, I, I keep track of really, and I print them out, or, or whatever the case will be. But then when we play our actual battles, we play the games, they can be played, you know, at a store, on the tabletop surface. But if we were playing at home, it would still be the same thing. We'd be playing on a separate surface. Now, if you're in a small space, such as I am, you might not have a whole lot of room to be setting up maps and setting up games and all sorts of stuff. So something like this, where you have a dedicated playing surface that you can also use as your map is cool. Now you're thinking, how did he do that? Basically, what he came up with was that he alternates how time flows. That you have like one day that you spend in your campaign. And in your campaign, the campaign day, I guess that's the best way to phrase it, your campaign day you're doing whatever you're doing, and then at the end of it, you're rolling a dice, and depending on what you roll on those on the dice, I think it's like a, a D100, a, a percentage dice, that you then determine how many t how much time passes from the day you just played to the next day. And now on top of this, units are able to move a certain amount of distance to indicate that they're traveling across the map, they're traveling to the battle, or, or whatever. And then, you know, they'll play the battle and so forth. Now, he came up with the 
conclusion that there are some problems with this because, for example, he derides a passage of time so that, you know, if you roll low, one night passes. You roll kind of medium range, two nights pass. But if you roll on the high end, which seemed to happen to him frequently in his playtest, four whole days pass. Four! So you could be getting ready and you have the first day of battle, right? The first time of battle, and you guys dig in and stuff, and you're getting ready to go, and then you roll, and bam, four days. Four days from the time you arrive on that battlefield to the next time you actually get to do something. And you, he explains it as, you know, you could kind of cover it with all sorts of stories. You could say that the person just wasn't sure when to start, or they weren't ready, or, you know, whatever. They're a little too cautious, or maybe they're still preparing, or, or you know, whatever. You can come up with stuff, but even so, four days seems like a lot to me. Now, uh, the book as a whole is really cool. I've spotted minimal errors in it, and by errors, I mean, you know, just little minor editing things. But overall, it's fantastic. The layout is really nice. It flows well. The articles are interesting. And although each article or each chapter, whatever you want to uh, phrase it, that each section of it covers, you know, a certain mechanic set in a certain time period, you really have to treat it as it's using the time period to test the mechanic. So that although the mechanic being discussed might happen to take place with the ancients and your thing might be modern war, right? You could then adapt it to use it in modern war. You don't have to use the same terminology from ancients. You can just change it and make it your own. The book is very old school in style in that it says, you know, we tried this and that didn't work. And we tried that and that didn't work. And we did this, and we liked that, so we kept that, and then we modified it and moved on and did this. Like, it, it's encouraging you to not copy, but use what Wally came up with to create your own, to adapt it to your uses. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed, because it reminded me a lot of Black Powder. One of the things I've long said about the Black Powder, quote-unquote, rule sets, or guidelines for gentlemanly wargaming, is that they say in the book multiple times that, you know, if there's something in this, one of the rules that doesn't work for you, that you don't like, or whatever, change it. They want you to change the rules to fit your needs. They know it's not a one-size-fits-all, because every gaming group plays things differently. Every person is different. We all are going to get enjoyment from a different way. So Black Powder says, you know what? You don't like how we do this mechanic? Make up your own. Do something different. Take it from somewhere else and put it in. And Wally's ideas, his rules, his suggestions are just that. They are suggestions. They are things that you can use, mechanics that you can take to be inspired by, to become motivated by. Take them, use them as they are, but then adapt them. If they don't work for you, if you want to do something different, you like kind of what he's doing, you like the basis, you like parts of it, take those parts and then add on and do whatever you need to. So this book is fantastic. I really enjoy it. And when I first picked it up, I thought, you know, I'm not sure if this is one that I would have bought on my own because it's interesting, right? But do I really want to spend money on it? And the answer is yes, you want to spend money on this book because the book has lots of stuff that covers a wide array of areas. It's not just covering, you know, a specific section. It's not just saying, we're only good for covering 1812 mechanics for the War of 1812 as part of Napoleonics. No, it says, we are enabling you to create, to be, to make your gaming what you want it to be. So it's really cool. Uh, I do notice that on the cover, which is beautiful color cover, it says volume one. I'm hoping that means there will be more of them. I don't know for certain though. So I want to give a little plea out to Russ over there that if you guys are able to put together a volume two and send it out, that I really think you should because it's fantastic. Now, price, right? Because if you want to buy this, and I'm hoping you do, and you should, because I think it's fantastic, you want to get this, you want to head over to onmilitarymatters.com, do a search for Secrets of Wargame Design, you'll find the book right there, it's priced at $19 American, that's a good price, it's, it's worth the money, it has lots of really good content, 
Now, one of the cool things that allows it to be more affordable is that you have the cover is color and the cover is, you know, it's nice and stuff, but inside is all black and white. There's no need for color in there at all. The pages aren't, you know, that glossy photo paper. It's none of that stuff. It's, it's not like a black powder book. It's not, you know, Hail Caesar or any of those. It's not a Games Workshop book. It's not one of those big glossy coffee table ones on set, you know, you pay 50, 60 bucks for, and people say, oh, it's okay though, because they're pretty, so they're nice to look at. I mean, things are cool if they're nice to look at, right? But this has its value and its content and the essence in the book. $19 is a fair price to pay. Uh, you know, if it was me, I, I would prefer $15, but I, hey, you know what? Things beyond my control. I'm not the one who said, Let's price this at 19. Let's price this at whatever. 19 is a fair price. You get a lot of content. One other cool thing about the book that I can't forget to mention is that many of the sections have little areas at the bottom. And it's titled Notes. And it's blank paper for you to just write in whatever you want. It's clear they want you to use this book. It, they want you to interact with it. To mark it up. Do what you need to. Not only do you want to, perhaps change Wally's mechanics and adapt them, but they want you to go ahead and do it inside the book itself. Don't be afraid to use it like you did in college. You know, in school, you would mark up a book. You bought the book and you needed to make notations to help you better understand or to try things out. Go ahead and do that with Secrets of War Game Design because there's designated areas for many of the sections that you can just make your notations. And do you know what? That's what I did. I made use of those. And I made my little notes, oh, this is really cool, I like that mechanic, and this mechanic's cool, and I don't understand this bound thing, but uh, ask Russ about it. You know, I made my notations and stuff, so you can be sure that the next time I'm hanging out with the guys at Battleground Games and Hobbies in Abington, that I will be bringing this book with me, showing it to them, and suggesting that they get it. Now, I know some of you guys are listening, so Adrian, Court, and of course, anyone else who happens to be going to Battleground, please... Buy this book. I don't know if Battleground sells it, but if not, ask Derek, ask Chase, ask whoever is at the store to order a copy. And if they can't do it, head over to onmilitarymatters.com. Do a title search for Secrets of Wargame Design, and then click on the Add to Cart button to buy your copy of this book for $19 American. Well, that's my review of Wally Simon's Secrets of Wargame Design edited by Russ Lockwood. I do have a quick announcement about this that I'm happy to share. I don't have a date yet. It's still being, you know, worked on, all the details being ironed out. But I am delighted to announce that Russ has agreed to be a guest here on the show. We're, you know, working that out, as I said, but he'll be talking about the book, and we'll see what else we can get him to talk about. He's done some work editing some other roles and writing some of his other roles for other areas. So I bet we can get him to talk about all sorts of stuff. So uh, I want to thank you, Russ, for sending me this. And I hope that people will go over to onmilitarymatters.com and buy a copy because it's really cool. I'm very excited about it. So at this point, I want to talk a little bit about the situation over at Battlefront Games. Um, Battlefront Miniatures, I'm sorry. The situation over at Battlefront Miniatures dealing with their official events. As you might recall, if you've listened to us last time, you will note that Battlefront made an announcement in which they said that for the 2013 tournament season, that all official events, aka those events run by Battlefront, that all of those events for Flames of War were requiring you to use only Battlefront models. If you bought models from any other company, you could not use them. Now, as you can guess, there was a lot of talk about this. Some good, mostly bad. Tons and tons and tons of people were talking a lot about this over at the official forums. Now, Battlefront has this history of basically removing anything from their forums that they don't like. <laughs> so if you think you're going to get, you know, equal <laughs> exposure there for all sorts of stuff, you're going to have a bad time. Now, despite that, they did cover a lot of ground with it. Now, since then, and perhaps as a result, no, no, not perhaps, because of all the people complaining about what was going on and saying how unfair it was and how they didn't like it, Battlefront released 
an update. And they released this actually a little while ago. It was Monday, July 16th. And I'm going to actually just read you the whole announcement. It's up on their website. We'll, of course, have a link to this in the show notes. But here's the announcement. Battlefront official events update. In all the years we have been in business, we have had an open and honest policy about listening to our gamers and generally taking their views on board to the extent of sometimes changing our plans. We apologize for the confusion and angst our announcement has caused, as it was never our intention. We did not see this change as a big problem, as we were simply formalizing something we already thought was existing, albeit informally. In the interest of compromise and fairness to everybody's opinion, we will change the word, quote, all, to, quote, majority, meaning over half, in the tournament rules for the 2013 season. Although we were not clear enough about this last week, we did not consider die-cast planes, scratch-built models, or objectives, assuming they are the right size. Terrain or models we do not currently make to be covered by this, As is always the case, if you are unsure, simply get in touch with your tournament organizer and clarify the situation, but we are going to revert to the best option in all cases. Common sense. The new season rules take effect from the Masters in December this year and only apply to the officially run Battlefront tournaments listed on our site. Independent tournaments are free to choose their own system as they always have been. One of the feedback ideas that did come back from our weekend conversations that we really liked was to also further reward people who came along with 100% Battlefront armies. This is an idea that we will definitely work on for the future. We are committed to supporting and growing the Flames of War hobby and want to invest more in the future in events, the website, and programs like the Rangers all of which we are happy to spend money on to provide this to you for free. We want to thank our moderators for doing such a sterling job this weekend, especially given they had no warning at all. We appreciate all the civil comments, whether for or against. We feel that our compromise shows that we believed all views have merit. We hope this once again proves that we do listen. Signed, Pete, John, and John Paul. So, You know, this announcement, it is sort of a reversal of things, but not completely because they do say majority, meaning over half. And they also say for this season, it doesn't mean forever. I firmly believe that they will be going back to the original announcement and implementing that at some point saying, do you know what? You want to play in an official event? You want to play in one of our official events run by us? You need to use models that we made. So I think that day will be coming, but I think it's also good of them that they were able to step back and say, do you know what? We just, we thought this was in place, but not really. We sprung it on you. So we're going to back off and let you use stuff for at least half of, uh, you know, events. And after the other half, you got to use the whole thing because it, you know, they try, I feel like they're trying to wean everyone off and get people to slowly kind of funnel in to using that all battlefront situation. I was really hard on Battlefront last episode, and I do not regret that at all because at the time, I felt that, you know, their decision was short-sighted, and I still feel that way. I think that their new announcement really isn't a compromise in so much as it is, you know, we're just going to make you think that you're getting what you want, but really we're getting what we want. So they're buying time is what they're doing, and maybe that's a cynical view of things, And maybe I'm cynical in general towards Battlefront. And that could be true. But, you know, in some ways it's nice. They're giving more time for people. But they did not need to ever shift over to a Battlefront-only model. Especially since they went ahead. John Paul himself went ahead and was quoted on their message boards at one point saying that they were in favor of allowing people to use Battlefront models and non-Battlefront models. They were in favor of you using stuff by other companies. And there's pictures on the internet you can go and find. And you can see a picture of his quote. And you can get, you know, everything exactly. I believe I took that and I put it up on our Facebook page. So if you head on over to our Facebook page, you know, it's facebook.com. And then look up CWF Gamecast slash Wargaming Recon. 
you will be able to find what John Paul Brizagotti said about this. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into depth about all of it, but he does cover it, you know, at one point where he says that it's okay for people to use non-Battlefront models. Clearly, things have changed. People are allowed to change their minds. So are companies. You know, times change, and that's just how it is. You have to adapt or perish. Now, I find it interesting that in their announcement, they thank the mods for doing a quote-unquote sterling job. Now, I'm not saying they should not thank the mods, because clearly, it's not easy to moderate anything, especially when you're dealing with a hostile audience. It's difficult, it's hard, and it's easy to become flustered. However, you know, there were some postings on their website that were less than, less than proper, I guess. I'm trying to find the right word. But they're less than appropriate to be coming from a staffer. So there was one individual, uh, JM, who posted several things. And basically, he was looking very derogatory towards the players, towards the people who were posting. Uh, you know, one post he did, and I actually, I have a screenshot of it, so I'm just going to read part of it. Uh, he posted this on July 12, 2012, and he says, It's at our tournaments. If a TO, meaning tournament organizer, wants his own regulations, then choose them. We will still offer support and prizes if asked. Though to all of you tournament organizers, I'm going to run a quick scenario by you. At your tournament, can I pay my mate Dave 60% and you 0% of the entry fee to come play at your event? I bet the answer is no, and for exactly the same reason as we would like you to use our stuff. You have bills to pay, and what does Dave do for you with running this event? Now, I, I understand that they're upset and stuff, and I, I get that he wasn't like, you're a moron and I hate you, whatever. But first of all, it's kind of a dumb <laughs> example that he gave. And second of all, well, do you know what? No. The reason why it's a dumb example is because there's still tournament entry fees for things, and you still have to pay to play. The difference is that JM and clearly people at Battlefront were confusing and merging the model-making side of things and the event side of things. Now, if one side, aka the model-making, is not making money, not making enough money, rather, then you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't liken that, the expense for that, you shouldn't liken that to the expense for the events. So people are paying to go to these events, and even if they don't have full 100% Battlefront armies, they're still paying to go to the event. So raise the entrance fees, do something. You know, I'm not a proponent of costing people more money if they don't, but, you know, it was just, <laughs> it was interesting to see how the staff were treating, or some of the staff anyway, how some of the staff was treating people who were posting. Clearly people were upset on both sides. Nerves were, you know, being tested and tempers were at their boiling point and all sorts of stuff. But there just was no need for some of the comments that were coming from both sides. It was, it was unacceptable, really. As the people at WWPD said on their forums, keep it classy, you know, and they're right. You can disagree, but do it respectfully. Don't call someone a moron. Don't say, hey, you, you bleep and bleep or whatever. You can be like, you know what? I don't agree with you, and I think you're wrong, but I respect that you're saying it, and I'm going to be respectful towards you, even though I may not agree with what you're saying and what you're doing. Well, I'm going to actually cover some more of this later on when I get to the mailbag, because there are other people's thoughts about the situation that came up before, and I don't want to steal all of their thunder. Now, uh, I had mentioned at the top of the show that War Games Illustrated, uh, the June 2012 issue, has been out, of course, for a little bit of time, and that I finally got around to looking at it. I just kind of wanted to talk about it very briefly, just really to kind of mention that if you haven't picked it up, you might like it. There's, of course, the usual great content, but what I found really interesting was the Cold Wars 2012 show report. I love seeing what's happening at some of these conventions and events. I don't always get to go to them, in a magazine like War Games Illustrated really helps you to feel like you're there because it gives you good coverage. You get the pictures, you get the imagery, you can feel like you're transported there. It was really cool. Of course, it also had stuff in Black Powder. I like that this issue also had some Saga in it. Uh, you know, I think it's really cool that Saga seems to be taking off 
and I haven't played it yet, but I'm looking forward to giving it a try, so I thought it was pretty sweet. Now, I had mentioned also earlier that my wife and I recently went to Plymouth Plantation. Now, you're thinking, what does Plymouth Plantation necessarily have to do with a gaming podcast? Well, I've been working on the Dead Hampton Revolution for a while. As some of you should know, the Dead Hampton Revolution is my, you know, homegrown campaign kind of thing based on the American Revolution. I've been lost in rules and, you know, movement rates and all that sort of stuff and creating maps and everything. And, you know, just like if you're going to another place, a a country for the first time, you're going to read those travel guides or whatever, but you also want the flavor. You want to get the feel for it. So maybe you read a mystery or some sort of fiction about it to help you feel like you can taste what it's like there. Now, Plymouth Plantation, same thing. My wife, I think, said she hadn't been there since she was like five or six. She was really, really little. And I was a little bit older the last time I had went. But basically, I had gone on school trips. So we had decided we were going to go. We went, and it was fantastic. The day was really hot. It was like 97 degrees or something. There were sweating buckets. And, you know, we we drove down to Plymouth, Mass, and went over to Plymouth Plantation. We got a pass from the library that basically let both of us in for, like, a third of the cost if you went separately and paid and stuff. So it was really cool. Now, one of the things that I really love about Plymouth Plantation is that I will freely admit that I am ignorant on most matters dealing with Native Americans. I just, I I don't understand it. I don't know. I want to know. But for so long, I was so, you know, Eurocentric for things when I was growing up. It was all like, oh, the pilgrims and the settlers and whatever, and the Indians were bad because they attacked and blah, blah, blah. And that's not the truth, you know? The more you read about it, the more you learn about it, the more you know that that's just not the case. So one of the cool things about Plymouth Plantation is the ability to interact with members of the Indian nation, the Native American nation, who still practice some of these traditional arts and the traditional skills that happened. And they work at Plymouth Plantation showing you what their ancestors did and teaching you about the whys and the hows. You really feel not only that you're transported there because you know, it's a recreation of what a homestead would look like for them. But through their stories, through their actions and words, and of course the costume and everything, you feel that, you know what, I'm understanding more. And that's what this is all about. We want to understand one another. We want to better ourselves by learning about each of us. We want to get that connection. So while we were there, we got to see a gentleman doing the final stages of hewing out you know, a, a, a tree that was being used as a ship. So he was setting, you know, small fires and he's explaining why you set the fires in the tree, right? Because the tree had been cut down, they hollowed it out, they, you know, they cut it in half and everything. And, you know, they don't need this to go to go to fishing or hunting or travel or whatever because it was easier to travel by, uh, you know, waterway than it was over land. So he said the reason why we set fire in this is because it helps to even it out And then also, the heat causes the sap to go from the inside all the way out to the outside and forms a watertight bond. He said that usually what would have been done was you would set fires throughout the log at the same time. So you would have, like, say, at the end, in the middle, or whatever, and they would all be going to help save time. Uh, He was doing just one end because it was just him kind of keeping an eye on things. So... You know, he was making some modifications for things. And then there was another fellow nearby who was repairing a fishing net. It was just rope. And they have it set up where, um, I guess they encourage maybe school children to come up and try tying some knots and things. And the kids sometimes leave openings a little bit bigger than they would like because, you know, the kids, are, they're enthusiastic and they're trying and it's really cool. But if you want to use this to catch fish, right, you want it big enough to catch the fish and not let them go. So... One person was repairing that. And then we also got to see one of the highlights for me was going into the lodge. It was a three-family abode where they had uh, an individual woman there who was talking about family life, how there's um, one wall is a life-giving wall, and that's the women's side of the lodge. And there's all things that, like, nourish life, like cooking and healing, and uh, they have, like, uh, child-rearing stuff over there. 
And for example, there's the uh, this board that kids sit on and they're carried, you know, uh, the women carry them and there's a band that goes up and around the woman's forehead and stuff, that that's made by the men, which would be life-taking. But because it's used for raising children, it's on the women's side as life-giving. And of course, on the life-taking side, it's the men's side of the uh, living space. And over there are things like, you know, hunting weapons and like all sorts of stuff. And then in the middle, it's all packed dirt, right? They have this long central area for fire. And the reason why you know it's for three families is because there's enough room there for three separate fires. Something I thought was really interesting was that she had remarked that you'd spent very little time in here. What you would do is most of your living was done outside, that you were only ever really inside if you needed to rest, like you were sick, you weren't feeling well, you're tired, or if you were going to sleep. And they slept on these beds, so to speak. They're more or less benches that go around the entire circumference, inside circumference, of the living space. And they're made out of, like, trees, really, limbs and wood and all that sort of stuff. So it's very hard, but what they would do is they would put lots of uh, animal skins down so that you would have these animal skins down to serve as your mattress, so to speak. And that each person, you know, you would sleep there. They'd be about three inches from you to the outside of the um, tent. And the rest was you and that you would have, you know, several of these animal skins per person. And then if it was cold, you would take the animal skin. And what you would do, despite what we see on television and movies, you would take the animal skin so that the fur was on the inside. It was against your skin. The soft part was against you, whereas the, you know, the other side of the pelt, was on the outside, and you would use the hat in the winter, or it was cold, or whatever. They remarked that in the warm months, the women were topless. They were, you know, just bottom, but otherwise topless, and, you know, that's how it was, because you came into the world that way, and you left the world that way. That the men and boys were, they wore nothing. After we were done seeing what it was like in the, you know, Indian quote-unquote village, we moved on, and they have another section over at Plymouth Plantation that deals with the colonists. Uh, they remarked that they never referred to themselves as pilgrims. That got picked up later on and was popularized, I think, in the 1800s, really. But when they first landed, they were colonists. You know, they were English people, although they lived, you know, in other parts of Europe before they came over and moved to the New World. They were English. They weren't pilgrims. We call them pilgrims these days, but they, they weren't. Uh, it's not a phrase they used for themselves, but we got to go and see the recreation of the fort, and you could see the meeting house, which also housed cannons, and it was really cool because they had church services there. When we were coming, we happened to just be going and walking down, um, I think it was near the end of a church, uh, church service, so we weren't able to see how worship was done, but we got to go and, you know, we went to some of the buildings, and they have uh, livestock there, and you can see what the living spaces were like. One of the things I really enjoyed was going into the craft building. They have the special building where all the materials that are used on the grounds are made by modern craftspeople in the styles and using techniques from the old time. So not too long ago, I had seen an episode of the Woodwright Shop. I'm really into the Woodwright Shop and, you know, PBS shows in general. I used to watch the Woodwright Shop as a child, and I mentioned a while ago when my grandfather had passed, I had mentioned watching it with him and you know over the years but i watched a recent episode and on it they had one of the guys from plymouth plantation on he was there well <laughs> there wood right so to speak it's not a you know real term but he's the one who uses wood to create the materials that they use the furniture and everything so got to see his workspace he wasn't there uh if he was i was going to ask for an autograph actually yeah, but it's going to be like hey i saw you on the wood right shop it was really cool could i get an autograph uh, lame, I know, right? But I got to see that area, got to see the glass making area, the pottery area, the leather making. It was really cool to be able to see the tools and the workspaces and everything. Got to take lots of pictures. So it was a fun day. And of course, at the same time, it really was useful for me because it helped to reinvigorate me with the flavor of the American Revolution and early colonial days here in New England. I've been working on Dead Hampton Revolution for a while. And, you know, you do anything for a while and you kind of lose steam a little bit and you need a little bit more fuel to keep you going. So this really helped out quite a bit. I was very excited about that. 
about being able to go to Plymouth and share the experience with my wife and look around, look at everything, see what it's like, and, you know, get some more fuel for my fire to continue work on Dead Hampton Revolution. Speaking of which, recently I, I like that word recently, don't I? Uh, not too long ago, I, I, um, I submit another order with my buddy Cord. Cord, I know you listen from time to time. Thank you. To get some more models from Old Glory to help expand my forces of uh, New Dead Hampton. So we are continuing to build our forces for the Dead Hampton Revolution, where we will be playing games using the black powder rolls and all that sort of stuff. If you're interested, you really should head over to the blog, wargamingforums.com, and then you'll be able to find all the Dead Hampton Revolution sort of stuff. I have a I have a tag up there actually you can click on it's over on the right hand side of the website and I get a tag it says um, actually I should make a tag that says Dead Hampton Revolution is what I should do but it says AWI American War of Independence and you just go ahead and you click on that and I'll show you all of that kind of stuff AWI you just click on it you can get all the Dead Hampton Revolution stuff of course there's podcast episodes that deal with it and all that kind of stuff but you'll be able to get updates about all of that. Now, I had mentioned earlier that I want to let you all know that we are now on Pinterest. You're thinking, Pinterest, really? A gaming podcast is a Pinterest account? What are you going to do with that? Well, I know that some reports have come out that showed something like 80% of users on Pinterest are female. And, um, you know, women like gaming, too. Women, Some of the best pages I've ever seen are women. Uh, you know, people who want Slayer Swords and stuff or GW things and just... In general, I've seen females who have made models that are a head and shoulders above anything that I've seen any man do. So I think we can really appeal to uh, a wider audience. You know, the women play games, women play love history, women are into the same stuff we do. So let's, you know, invite them to the show. Let's get them going on and get some feedback from all you ladies and uh, hear from you. And let's share some content that you want to listen to that you're eager for. Maybe, you know, as a, a woman, maybe you personally just, you're not into gaming. You're not into this sort of stuff. Maybe you prefer other things. You prefer sports. You prefer, you know, whatever. But maybe there's someone in your life, a significant other, whoever, who's really into gaming and you just don't get all of it. Well, listen to the show. Listen to Wargaming Recon and maybe you'll understand a little bit more about the stuff that gives enjoyment to your significant other, to the people who are special in your life. So we are on Pinterest, and right now I get some pictures of of um, my JR Miniatures building that I painted not too long ago. So if you head over to Pinterest.com slash Wargaming Recon, you'll be able to find what I have up right now. I will, of course, be adding more content, things I see on the web, whatever, but primarily it will be used to share photographs of conventions, of, you know, whatever strikes my fancy, things that might be of interest to you for... Uh, the reasons you love here on the podcast. Now, finally, uh, let's get into the mailbag. And this is going to be a big one. It's a long show so far, but I think you're going to find the mailbag worth listening to. So mailbag this time is a little different in that what I'm going to be talking about are primarily comments posted onto our Facebook page. Now, if you posted a comment on there, of course, you know, it's a public forum. So we're using them to share your thoughts about things. I had posted uh, a post, really, a, a picture of a post that John Paul Brizagotti posted in regards to the situation at Battlefront. Now, as you can guess, most of the mailbag deals with the last episode in which we talked about the situation over at Battlefront. And, of course, I updated that near the beginning of the show. But way back then, I had posted a picture, and it's a post that at, was posted at the time of... Um, of one of the individuals there. And Adrian B. had remarked that um, the author of the post is unhappy that people are unha unhappy. I wonder what kind of reaction he thought they'd get. I will say that he's right in that some comments are a bit more vehement than they need to be. And Adrian, I agree with you. People, you know, stay classy, right? There's no need to get in anyone's grill about things. We can be respectful about stuff. Now, there were quite a few comments made dealing with another post I had did in which I have to apologize because I I made this post after I saw what the new announcement was from Battlefront um, and I misread the announcement at the time. 
it's completely my fault. I misread it in that I saw that they said they were thinking about giving some sort of bonus, some sort of um, benefit, some perk, right, to people who use 100% Battlefront armies. And for whatever reason, I took that to mean that the perk they give, if they end up doing this, because they have not said they would, but if they end up doing this, I just kind of made that jump it as illogical as it is in retrospection. I made the jump to think that the bonus that they would be given would be in the tournament, that they would be giving, uh, you know, a statistical edge to those who use 100% Battlefront models. That, you know, if you show up with all that stuff, you're going to get an extra 10 points, right? And anyone who doesn't, doesn't get those 10 points. That's erroneous. They've not said that. It was just me. And I, again, I need to apologize because I was wrong. And I just, I did that jump and I, I don't know what. It was ridiculous. But people had responded to my note because I said that, you know, I read what they had said and I thought, so they're saying they'll allow you to bring other models made by other companies like they encouraged and promised for years past. But if you do, they will penalize you by giving a bonus to everyone who fields armies using only Battlefront models? What a crock. Now, I just want to state again, they are not saying that. Battlefront is not saying that. That's just me. Back then, I was being crazy, and I thought I misread, and I I was wrong, is the point. But there was a, a lot of comments about that. Uh, one individual they pointed out that they're not saying that, and he's right. They are not saying that, and that he said that I had to be fair, and he, he's right, that why would a company not be allowed to change its mind? Encouraging behavior by reward is the most positive way to bring about what they want at their own tournaments. Would you have been so negative if they had not gone about it so dis disastrously last Thursday? And, you know, there was some discussion back and forth between this individual and I. And eventually, you know, I came out and said, you know what? I need to clarify and need to be fair that just like I did, that Battlefront never said that the bonus they would give would be a bonus that involves giving some extra points or whatever in the tournament or whatever. There was another individual, Norman, who said that they think the announcement is pretty fair, that they thought people should have 100% Battlefront models, that many of us thought otherwise. They met in the middle. I think no rule like it was is better, but if they can meet us halfway for myself, I think I can do the same. And Norman, I think that's a fair accommodation. I really do. Uh, there was a lot of other talk going on about the announcement that uh, it, it was interesting to read. I enjoy getting feedback. I, I love getting feedback. I talk about this all the time, how much I love your feedback, and I do. I I can't get enough of your feedback. I, I really do enjoy hearing from you and, you know, talking with all of you about all sorts of stuff. So I love all of that. Uh, one individual, <laughs> Mike Payne, actually, uh, he, he liked my post about it, and... Um, Again, I, I can apologize. I just I jumped off the deep end or whatever. I didn't think <laughs> I misread. But anyway, uh, Adam from Fencing Frog, he kindly gave a voicemail last time that I played for you. But he's the owner and blogger of fencingfrog.blogspot.com. Please check it out. And he posted on Facebook that he thinks the new announcement is fair, that after all, they are not required to reward you for fielding the other guy's stuff. This is a smart position to take or would be if it had been their initial position. Still, they did a quick reversal on hearing feedback. Not many companies do that. And I have to agree with you, Adam. I do give Battlefront props for being willing to get the feedback as hard as it was to get it and to absorb it and to say, do you know what? We messed up, right? Let's fix this. Because you look at some companies, right? You look at, oh, I don't know, Netflix, right? They're like, we're going to split our service, give you a new name and all sorts of stuff. And immediately people were saying how bad that was, but it took them ages to be like, you know what, you're right, it's bad, we shouldn't do this. Whereas Battlefront was like, oh, do you know what, people are saying this is bad, it's not good, and you know what, we're going to listen to it, and you're right, and we're going to fix this. So I give them lots of props for going ahead and saying, do you know what, that we're going to fix this, and that they responded to the complaints of their customers, right? Because we are their customers, if we're buying their product, playing in their games, we're their customers, so it pays to listen to the customer, because if you don't, if you don't give the customer what the customer wants, what the customer needs, then you find yourself out of business, right? Now, another individual, Mark Owen, right, he left another remark, and Mark, I appreciate you, of course, leaving a comment here for me. I, I really enjoy comments. He says that, uh, 
let me go back. I'm trying to paraphrase, but uh, he says that if JP had been more upfront about the reason that they were doing this, that all parts of the business need to make money for the company as a whole to survive, then it might have gone down a lot better. As it stands, I can see PSD, PSC, rather, which is the Plastic Soldier Company, and FIB reducing Battlefront's market share so much that they're in danger of killing off the game that they're capitalizing on. And, you know, Mark, you bring up a really important point, right? Because if there's a symbiotic relationship, right? Sharks, for example, have a symbiotic relationship where there's these smaller fish who come up and they eat the remains of food near the shark's mouth and they clean their teeth and stuff, right? But uh, if the symbiotic relationship, if you're too good at one side, you're no longer in balance. You're disrupting the flow of things. And then you could kill off your host, right? And you don't want to do that. It's like, um, I've been playing a lot of, um, <laughs> iOS games lately. And one of the games that I've been playing is, uh, it's really cool. It's called Plague Incorporated. It makes me think of pandemics, sort of, right? But in Plague Incorporated, you play as a disease. You name it whatever you want and give it characteristics and stuff. But if you're too lethal in there, right? If you're disease, you, the disease, are too lethal in the game, you kill your host off before you can jump to another host, right? And the goal of any organism is to stay alive, right? Whether it's a person, whether it's an animal, whether it's a company, right? Or a game or anything like that. So if a company has this relationship with another company, right? And if their existence is hugely related to the existence of company A, of entity A, if they kill off the host, if they kill off entity A, then where do they think they're going to be? So, you know, it's good to be good, it's good to be effective, but you don't want to be too much where you throw the balance off, right? You don't want to put things in danger, and that's a bad thing. So it's just something to keep in mind. I'm sure things will be worked out in the future. I want to thank everyone who gave feedback on Facebook, who sent information, and all sorts of stuff. I love hearing from all of you. I did get another email, actually, from Adam, Adam over at Fencing Frog, right? And Adam was kind enough to send me an email asking if I heard about a game called Maurice. Now, Maurice has been covered in War Games Illustrated and Battle um, Games Magazine has an article on it. I was turned on to it by two members of my gaming group, Court and Adrian. I've looked a little bit at the rules, but have not really sent, spent much time, you know, getting involved with them. But Adam suggested the rules because he says that he has some minor reservations with it, but overall, he thinks it's a great game, especially for those times that you just want to get in a quick game. It's set in the 18th century, and that he thinks it especially fits the War of Austrian Succession, period, say 1720 to 1750 or so, that they have a very enthusiastic forum, with, and that he got a lot of traffic from there because he posted on his blog about his first game using it, and his thoughts about Maurice, and then of course he posted on the forum to be like, hey, I did this thing about Maurice, so what do you think? And he said he got a lot of traffic from it, so clearly people are passionate about Maurice, about the Sam Mustafa games and all of that. This is on my list of things to look into, and uh, hopefully sometime I will have a review of it, but at this point, I don't have one just yet. So Adam, thank you for your email, and of course, if anyone ever wants to get in touch with me, you know, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Pinterest now, we are on Stitcher Radio, and you can send an email to cwfgamecast at wargamingforums.com. And then, of course, and this is what I think perhaps is one of the best ways to do it, if you have a computer, and you probably do since you're listening to the show, but if you have a computer and you have a microphone, uh, most computers nowadays come with a microphone or you can get one cheaply enough, but if you've got a Mac, it has one built in, right? You can go to our website, and then over on the right side, the far right, is a little thing that says send voicemail. You click on that, and you can leave me a voicemail, right? It doesn't cost you a dime. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't need a phone or nothing. You just do that. You can send me a little voicemail. I get a message saying, hey, you got a new message, right? I can listen to it, and then I can easily take your voicemail and put it into the show and share your thoughts with people. And I will do that. If you leave me voicemails, I will listen to them. I promise and then I'll take whatever applicable ones, put them in the shows, share them with everyone else, because I, I want to encourage this. I think that leaving me a voicemail probably is the best way to do it. Plus, you know, I can paraphrase what you write or whatever, and I, I will, and I'll read, you know, I'll quote things as necessary, but people can hear things in your own voice. And, you know, these episodes go on for about an hour or so, and 
you, you're listening to me, you, you're listening to me, right, talk for a whole hour. Sometimes I have guests and stuff to help break things up, but it's still, you know, it's me for an hour. This gives you a chance to be heard, right? So you can be heard by your fellow gamers. So head on over to wargamingrecon.com. And over on the right is a little button that says send voicemail. Click on that, and you can send the voicemail. Like I said, all you need is a computer and a microphone. It doesn't cost you a dime. It's completely free. So that's about all the time that I have here for you guys in this episode of Wargaming Recon. I want to thank all of you for listening to the show. I want to remind you to head on over to onmilitarymatters.com, pick up your copy of Wally Simon's Secrets of Wargame Design. Then be sure to check out all the new happenings over at Battlefront by going to www.flamesofwar.com. Of course, you can pick up copies of Wargames Illustrated either by going to the Wargames Illustrated website or, better yet, Head to your local game store, support the independent stockist near you, and pick up copies from the newsstand right there. You can get it instant gratification. If you're interested in Plymouth Plantation, and if you're in New England or will be, I strongly suggest that you come, that you check it out, and you give it a visit. Go to www.plimoth.org. That's Plymouth.org, P-L-I-M-O-T-H dot org. You can find us over at Pinterest by going to www.pinterest.com slash wargamingrecon. As I mentioned, I am delighted to announce that uh, sometime in the not-too-distant future that I'm going to be having Russ Lockwood as a guest here on the show. And then near the end of the year, I will also be scheduling an interview and interviewing once again Angela Haru, media director for Total Con, where I'm looking forward to appearing in 2013. Going to be running a game with my buddies Court and Adrian. Uh, lastly, before I go, and, you know, normally I would give this its whole section in the show, and, you know, next time I think I'll probably talk about it some more. But I just want to suggest that you head over to the blog, wargamingforums.com, because I have a blog post up there titled Amended Unrealistic Goals for 2012. In January, I kind of made my top 10 goals, a list of 10 things I want to do this year. And, uh, you know, more than six months have gone by, and I took the time to think about what I've done and what I can do, and I reevaluated and amended the goals. So I have my new goals for the rest of the year up to see how things are going. You can see what I've done so far, what I'm going to be doing, there is some news there that you're going to want to find out about. But if you're not going to be able to make it over to the blog, wargamingforums.com, just yet, you can be sure that I will be talking about it most likely in the next episode of Wargaming Recon. Uh, as always, all of the things that I've talked about will be covered in the show notes. You can find those by going to the blog, wargamingforums.com, or you can also check out trollitc.com. That's www.trollitc.com. Why is that you say? Well, Wargaming Recon is a proud member of the Troll in the Corner podcast network. So all this stuff goes live on wargamingforums.com where, uh, you know, you can listen live, you can stream episodes live, and you get the show notes and everything. But then I mirror the show notes over at Troll ITC. Because not everyone who goes to TrollITC goes to WargamingForms.com and vice versa. So this way we kind of get the whole audience both sides of the thing. But if you're interested in the show, if you want your friends to subscribe to us or whatever, send them to WargamingForms.com because we have links to our RSS feed. They put that into any sort of RSS thing like Juice or iTunes or whatever, and they subscribe to the show. We got links to all the sorts of other stuff. It's the best way to listen to the show. Or they could just head over to Stitcher.com, and uh, when they get to Stitcher Radio, look us up. We're giving Recon. You can listen to us live there, or there's apps you know, for iOS and Android and all sorts of stuff, so they can use Stitcher to listen to us on the go just about anywhere. Well, thank you again for listening to me, Jonathan Ryan. I talked to you about all the things that happened this time on Wargaming Recon. It's been a pleasure. I want to thank you once again for allowing me to enter your lives, to enter your homes, to get this chance to spend this time with you, talking to you about all things historical and New England gaming. So, you know the drill. As always, keep on gaming. 
Wargaming Recon is a proud member of the Troll in the Corner Podcast Network. If you enjoy Wargaming Recon, you might enjoy some of the other shows on the network. So here's the lineup. Every Wednesday is a new episode of Indie Talks with Ben Gerber. Ben is the owner of Troll ITC, and on Indie Talks, he covers independent games, movies, television. He performs interviews with guests, gives reviews, and much more. He claims it's a bi-monthly podcast, but actually, you can get a new episode every Wednesday. Geeks Explicitly is a show I co-host with my buddy Drew McCarthy. We release new episodes every Thursday covering all aspects of geek life. Look for reviews, interviews, and much more. Of course, Wargaming Recon is a bi-monthly historical and New England gaming podcast featuring interviews, reviews, convention coverage, giveaways, and much more. Then, Gamer Tunes, another show I do, is a bi-monthly gaming music podcast where you can find music to play in your games or when you're just chilling with your gaming buddies. All music on the show is either free, freely available via the Creative Commons, or artists have given me permission to play it. You can check Gamer Tunes twice a month. Finally, Monsters of the Shattered World is a monthly podcast hosted by Brent Newhall. Brent is one of the other editors at TrollITC.com. Monsters of the Shattered World is a story-type podcast just like the old Sherlock Holmes radio. If you like any of these, or you just want to see what's going on, please head over to TrollITC.com. Be sure to click on the Troll in the Corner Podcast Network logo. This is Andreas, apprentice of the White Order. I would like to invite you to listen to my letters, a humble collection of my observations of the various beautiful and very, very dangerous creatures that inhabit my world. I hope you enjoy it as part of the Monsters of the Shattered World on Troll in the Corner at TrollITC.com. Hey there, this is Ben Gerber from Troll in the Corner, and I'd like to invite you to listen to my podcast, Indie Talks. Indie Talks is a discussion about independent publishing, where we take a look at indie games, the people who write them, and the people who play them. We're going to branch a little farther afield as well and talk to some independent television and movie stars and creators, as well as crafters, all of who are related to gaming in some way, shape, or form. So please join me on the Troll in the Corner Network at TrollITC.com and give Indie Talks a listen. Geeks Explicitly. New episodes every Thursday with Drew and Jonathan talking about geek life. If you don't listen to Geeks Explicitly, then only at TrollITC.com. Wargaming Recon is a proud member of the Troll in the Corner podcast network. Visit www.trollitc.com for more information. This recording is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. Look for Wargaming Recon online at www.wargamingforums.com. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Stitcher Radio. You can learn more about this episode by reading the show notes on our blog. Many thanks to Andrew and Court for inspiring the show's name. Thank you for listening, and keep on gaming.